Hello, this is Father John Sheridan, and I am the pastor of Saints Martha and Mary here in Lakeville. I'm also the pastor of Sacred Heart in Middleborough and St. Rose of Lima in Rochester, and we are known as the Cranberry Catholic Collaborative. And it's my honor to be with you again on this new program we're calling Go and Make Disciples. When I look at the calendar right now, and I know this is being taped, um, where we are, where we stand on the calendar, it's just about the middle of March and changes in the air in so many ways. Thanks be to God that big yellow thing in the sky finally came out, finally. We got temperatures over 20 degrees and things are warming up very quickly. All that snow is beginning to melt very quickly and we're beginning to look ahead. Um, there are signs everywhere of new hope. The first sign arrived on our doorsteps just a few days ago the three Easter candles. Uh, we're looking forward to a great Easter. In fact, in our collaborative, we are welcoming uh, three new members of the family. We will be baptizing two uh, children at the Easter Vigil at Sacred Heart, and, uh, and, and, and their father will be, will be uh, uh, confirmed in the uh, adult confirmation a little later on. And there are so many other symbols. We are in the middle of Lent right now. We've already passed the halfway point. Thanks be to God. And uh, it's hard to believe things are going, beginning to go very quickly. It's exciting. It's a great time of year. I was remarking that I, uh, to, to, to some folks that today, actually, this day that I'm taping, March 13th, two years ago, we elected a new pope. Uh, a new pope was, was appointed. Not we elected, but he was elected. What a great moment it was, what a very exciting moment. And I was saying, telling folks that, as I told the story to Cardinal Sean, I was in Lakeville uh, spying. Uh, I'd been appointed uh, to the collaborative and I wanted to go check out, see what the buildings are like, et cetera, et cetera. And I was sneaking down here, turned on the radio and heard to my shock, we have a new Pope, which made me turn into a park, uh, one of the parking lots here on Route 18. And I just pulled over and began to pray. I prayed for whoever this Pope would be, and I also prayed that it wasn't Cardinal Sean, because we needed him. But thanks be to God, Pope Francis has been everything we could have wanted and so much more. What a joy. Um, he radiates, radiates such peace and su such hope and such love. And we look forward to celebrations to come. There is so much going on in our collaborative. Uh, on, our, on Fridays, we have, we have stations, stations at 4 o'clock at Sacred Heart, at 6 o'clock here at Saints Martha and Mary with soup following, and also um, stations at 7 o'clock at St. Rose with soup beforehand. We also have our Wednesday evenings that are filled with prayers and also opportunity for reconciliation. To, we will keep a light on for the sacrament of confession. But so many other celebrations, so many opportunities to grow in faith and hope and love which is really what Lent is all about. Probably wondering about these symbols in front of me. What I'd like to do with this time, a little bit of time, is to share about what sacraments are all about. In our Catholic faith, we use sacraments to grow in our relationship with God and with one another. The beautiful thing about the sacraments is that they are a very personal moment, but also a very public moment. A celebration of the joy that we feel for the individual, but also the joy that we feel for the wider community. The seven sacraments that we receive, just like every other Catholic, I roll them off in terms of when you get them, are baptism, reconciliation, first communion or Eucharist, confirmation, the sacrament of matrimony or marriage, and, uh, or, holy, and or holy orders, because as we know, deacons, for example, are both married and they are, um, they are ordained to their roles, and also the sacrament of anointing. And what I'd like to do over our next few programs is to walk us through these sacraments, what they mean, what they represent, and uh, what they speak to us at certain moments in our lives and in, the, uh, and, and in, the, and in the, the life of the wider community. I always remind people that as Catholics, we never pray alone. Uh, we have an intimate moment with the Lord, but also we share them with everyone else. And it's so fitting that we should talk about the sacraments as we turn the corner and now look forward to Holy Week and Easter. By the way, speaking of Holy Week and Easter, a few points. It's hard to believe, but 
Palm Sunday is coming up very quickly. And I'm urging everybody, please, whatever Mass you go to, whether you go to Mass here at St. Martha and Mary or over at Sacred Heart or St. Rose, I want everyone to wear red. Uh, I love to see a sea of red. If you want to wear your Red Sox stuff, fine. Just make sure it's red so that we can celebrate, we can rejoice as one. We'll also be wearing red at another time. And I want you to think about what that, what that day might, might be after Easter. Yes, of course, it is the Feast of Pentecost, the sending forth of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, sending them out to proclaim the good news. So red is a very important color. And I would love to see all of our churches festooned with people dressed in red. As we head to, to Easter, we will continue the great tradition in Lakeville of the sunrise service on Easter morning. Um, and we'll do it just as the sun rises. What a privilege it is for me. And if you haven't seen it yet, you certainly may go on my, my Facebook page. Uh, so many people do, and it's, it's, I, I'm delighted to have them come on and to see the pictures that I take just about every morning over, over at the lake right across the, the street from the rectory. Um, I love, love living here. I love waking up in the morning and seeing that, that sun just come up so beautifully over the water. And we're going to continue the fine interfaith tradition with the other Christian churches here in Lakeville to, to welcome our Savior and our King in prayer and in song. So please come and join us on Easter Sunday morning as the sun rises, as we welcome our Lord and our King. But let's talk about baptism. It's so important um, as, as, as we head toward Easter to remind ourselves of the importance of this sacrament. It is the most important sacrament. Often people will come and say to me, well, what about First, first Communion or Eucharist? Well, maybe the most fun sacrament. I can't wait for First Communions that are coming in May. May is going to be one crazy month around here. Pray for all of us. It's going to be nonstop, but it'll be a lot of fun. First communions and confirmations. But First Communion may be, for many, the most fun sacrament, but baptism is the most important because it paves the way to receive all the other sacraments. It is the one sacrament that unites all of Christianity. Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I'm hoping and I'm looking forward to working with all the other great ministers in this town. That we can celebrate our, our, our Christian faith. That we can celebrate um, what we share, what, what unites us as one. It's been my privilege to assist at, at, uh, at baptisms in, in other churches that, that uh, priests are welcome to exercise a role. And it's been my privilege to work with so many ministers in so many of the sacraments. So I look forward to, to that celebration as well. In the celebration of baptism, we use four major symbols, water, clothing, fire, and oil. These symbols we use every single day, over and over again. Sometimes we take them for granted. But if we understood how powerful these symbols are, we could come to a deeper and more, fully, and a more full understanding of our own faith and how we're called to live it. As Catholics, we understand that we receive it once in, in our lives, physically. But spiritually, we believe that we receive it every single day. We are renewed by, by, by the waters of baptism. They spring ever new in our lives. And as much as I remind people that when we walk into a church for Catholics, what's one of our first instincts? We'll take the holy water and make the sign of the cross. But I also remind people, when you, when you, when you prepare yourselves in the morning, when you wash yourselves, when you take a bath, when you take a shower, let that be a symbol a reminder of your own baptism. Water is a miracle. It is an absolute miracle. Two, hearts, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. And we use it for so many different things as well, to slake our thirst, but also to refresh us, to renew us. Water is a lot of fun. Water is also a source of energy. Um, it's a beautiful thing just to, even just to look at. It's a, it's a miracle. Um, but it's also dangerous. Sometimes we, for, we forget that part about water. Water is incredibly dangerous until we're right in the middle of it. I think the people of New Orleans can point us out about how dangerous water can be. And we've also struggled with water around here, the frozen kind, uh, in so many different ways. Water has the, the, the amazing ability to 
to exist in three different states at exactly the same time, as a liquid, as a solid, and as gas, um, whether, it be, whether it be vapor or steam. And I think one of the most amazing things is the fragile beauty of water. Um, we saw those pictures off of Wellfleet, all the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the beaches of Wellfleet, in the harbor, and also down at the, uh, the National sea Seashore. Those enormous, uh, they, they look like uh, icebergs. But well, they remind us what a miracle it is. We use water as Christians to, ro to remind us about that we are reborn in Christ. Now, people often talk to me about, you know, why, did, do I, why did our Lord have to get baptized? Well, he was the Son of God, of course. He didn't really need it. But it was the beginning of his journey, the beginning of his ministry. And as Catholics, you know, we believe that, that, that we begin our work of ministry. We are all called to ministry. That's why, we all, that's why you'll hear me say it over and over again, that we're, we're called to a discipleship. We're called to, to become disciples. We're also called to make them. That's part of our, what we're here to do. We're here to share the good news, to receive it and also to give it. Not just to hold it to ourselves or only to the people that we feel comfortable with, but to go out and to proclaim the good news in good times and in bad times, in season and out of season. And Jesus began his ministry with John the Baptist in the waters of the Jordan. And uh, I often tell the story how I worked in a parish in Jordan, Montana. Uh, a, a friend of a friend of a friend connected me, and I wound up working. A priest couldn't, could, uh, was, was on call for the military, and it was my privilege to, to take his parish for a couple of weeks. Jordan, Montana. You will not find Jordan, Montana on a map. You literally will not. I asked how to get there, and they said, okay, here's what you do. First you go to Billings, then you go four hours north. You'll find it. Well, that was a lot of help, but I found it, and there was a parish called St. John the Baptist Parish in Jordan, Montana. Not everybody got the pun, that, that <laughs> got the idea that here was St. John the Baptist Parish in the middle of Jordan, Montana, in the middle of what seemed far-flung territory. But in that territory was a church alive with the Holy Spirit. And it was a blast to work in that little church. The church was tiny, absolutely tiny, but it was packed. Packed, fill, f packed full of hope and of joy and of Catholic uh, presence and, 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 and that, uh, that understanding of being missionaries. That's what we're all called to be, missionaries. The water that, that we use refreshes us and it gives us new life. Now, I'm going to go out a little bit. I want you to go out with me. I'm going to walk out a little symbolically uh, on, on a limb. I've been doing this for 25 years, and there are celebrations to come, by the way. Uh, I look forward to them. But I've been doing this for 25 years. I've baptized hundreds. Maybe I've reached thousands. I don't know. Of, of, of babies, children, adults, all sorts of, all sorts of folks. Symbolically, Symbolically, go with me on this, I will symbolically drown everyone I baptize. Symbolically, I promise you, I haven't lost one yet. And here's what I'm talking about. And this is nothing, the, the church has taught this for 2,000 years. Believe me, I'm not in the business of introducing anything new, if you know what I mean. As Christians, we look to the, the, the mystery of Good Friday how Jesus had to die to rise again. He, he accepted the will of his Father. He understood that this was part of what, what, what this mystery entailed, and he offered himself for our sins, for us, to give us that promise of eternal life. And so he died so that he may rise again. Symbolically, whenever a child or an adult or anyone else is baptized, we pour water over their heads. Or we'll go out to a pool or to a lake or sometimes to the ocean to baptize them. Many Catholic churches have pools. So there's full immersion. We're not there yet. That day may come. 
and we need to be open for it because that's what the church would call us to be and to do. And we need to be open to what the, what, what the Holy Spirit calls us to do through the church. But right now, what I do is when I pour water over the head of a child or an adult, and um, this, this past week I baptized seven babies. It was wonderful, joyous. Pouring water over their heads, symbolizing that they are dying through the waters to rise again to new life, to new hope, to new joy. So those waters at first became a symbol of dying, became a symbol of rising as Jesus rose again. So through our baptisms, we are given new life and new hope. We are born again. We come to new life in Christ. Every day, our faith teaches us we begin again. Pope Francis talks about it all the time, how merciful God is, how loving God is, that God never gets tired of loving or forgiving us. Always willing to give us another chance, a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a fifth chance, how many chances we need to, get to, to become more and more what, we're, what, what we were created to be, what we were conceived to be, God's holy people. And through our baptism, we're given that opportunity. So the water that we receive renews us, gives us life, and gives us hope. The second symbol I like to talk about is oil. You know, when you think about oil, you think of either the stuff you put in your car, the stuff you put on your salad, the stuff you heat your house with. Fair enough. Um, those are all oils. But the oil that we use in the sacrament of baptism, first of all, is, uh, is, is derived from olive oil. But the two oils that we use is the oil of catechumens and chrism. Let me explain a little bit. The oil of chrism, which is in this, um, in this container, um, and it's, and it's um, sur no, I'm sorry, this is chrism. Ha! Ah! This is the oil of catechumens. It's embedded in, in this cotton. The oil of catechumens begins our journey of faith. It's symbolic of our journey of faith. I love movies. That's, that's no surprise. One of my favorite movies are the um, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Love them. Trust me. I have a point to this. In the last Pirates of the Caribbean movie, there was a character, a new character, named the, um, the Catechist. Now, you remember the Catechist, if you, if you remember the movie, was the only person in the movie who never carried a weapon. Everyone had a weapon, except the catechist. And everyone had to listen to the catechist. Everyone had to do what the, what the catechist called them to do. The, the, the good and the bad, it was amazing. They were all ready to fight, and suddenly the catechist swooped in, and they had to listen to him. Unfortunately, the catechist fell in love with a mermaid. And we all know what happens in those movies when you fall in love with a mermaid. It's not pleasant. But the catechist role was very powerful and very unique. Had a, was, was a teacher. And that's really what a catechist is. The words catechist, catechumen, and catechism, and many of us remember that word catechism from growing up, all are from the same root, teaching and learning. Teaching and learning our faith. We anoint those who will receive the oil of catechumens to begin their journey of faith. And the beauty of our faith is that, one of the beauties of our faith, as we know, is that the more we learn, the more we teach. And the more we teach, the more we learn. I love to, to, to talk to new parents and, and, and ask them if their child has taught them more than they've taught them. Than the, the, that they've, let me try this again. That, that the child has taught them more than they'll ever teach their child. And they say yes. The child has taught them what is important. That's what children do. They remind us. They point us in their own naivete, in their own, in their own beauty, in their own innocence. What is beautiful? What is sacred? Life, joy, peace, love. All the things that as adults we forget along the way. Children remind us and they point us to where we need to be and to go. The oil of catechumens. What happens is I will take that oil and I'll make the sign of the cross over the child's heart. Because faith begins here before it gets here. I cannot love God, love God. I cannot know God unless I love him first. How do I experience the love of God? Well, in family. That's where it begins. Not when, you know, learning and, and books, 
very important. But if I don't love it first, I'll never learn it. I'll never come to a deeper understanding unless I love first. Now let's get to the sacred chrism. C-H-R-I-S-M. Chrism. Chrism is a concoction of oil and perfume, and it smells really sweet. People talk about going to a christening. This is what, what, what is implied. But I prefer the word baptism. That's the word the church uses. Because it wants us to remind, it wants to remind us that it's so much more than just this moment. Chrism, again, is a concoction of oil and perfume, and it smells really sweet. I think about, think about it a lot, about the old days when people would sign, would have very important documents. I would take a wax seal and then seal the document. There it is. It's official. It's done. It's taken care of. The chrism that we use seals the baptism, makes it official. It's done. And what I do with the oil, with the chrism, is I'll take a little bit and I'll make the sign of the cross over the child's head. And that is where the, that is where the crown and the kingdom of heaven will go. An interesting thing about the chrism, to point out, is that the same chrism we use at baptisms is the same chrism, is, is the oil that we use at confirmations and at ordinations. I'm going to get to that in a second. The baptismal robe. It's been my joy as a priest to serve in a lot of different assignments, to do a lot of different work. And uh, for four years I was chaplain in a, in, a, in a Catholic high school. Loved it. Kids were great. We had a lot of fun, learned a lot, grew, grew a lot in faith, hope, and love. Students were terrific. But they used to whine to me all the time, because they're teenagers. That's why God put them on this earth sometimes. Um, and they used to wonder me, why do we have to wear uniforms? We hate to wear uniforms. Uh. And I used to point out to them, in this classroom, you are all dressed the same. So I'm not, I, I want you to understand that in this room you're all equals. We live in a society, in a culture that judges people by how they dress. That, that perhaps the way a person dresses is the way that they are. But you're so much more than that. I want to listen to your words. I want you to see what's in your hearts, in your minds, and in your souls. So in this room, you are all equals. I want to probe what's, what's in your hearts and souls. The baptismal robe is a symbol of our unity in Jesus Christ, that we're all priests of Jesus Christ. I'm going to share with you again something that the church has taught for 2,000 years. There are two priesthoods in the Catholic Church. There are two. Often people think there's only one, but there are two. The priesthood of the ordained, which is what God has called me to, and the priesthood of the baptized, which we've all been called to. The priest is called to do three primary jobs. One is to celebrate the sacred mysteries of, of the Mass and the sacraments, and to take care of the prayers, and to uh, deliver the prayers of the church. The second responsibility of a priest is to proclaim the gospel to preach it by words and, and in actions. A great saint once said, if you must, uh, if you must preach God's word, preach it. If, if necessary, use words. I love that. I love that. The third responsibility of a priest is to love and serve his people, to do the best he can, to, to administer God's love, God's mercy, God's justice. But in actuality, we're all called to do that. We all call, we all pray together. All of us have a, have a role. It's really important for us to understand that. Our society wants, to, wants, wants that to be structured. We will not structure that. It is God's work. It is God's church. It is not my church. It is not your church. It belongs to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. We all have roles to play. We all have important roles to play to bring about the kingdom of God. All of us are called to participate in the celebrations, to be part of them celebration of Mass, the celebration of the sacraments, to participate in the life of the Church to the best of our ability. We're also called to, to live the Gospel, to preach the Gospel by the way we live, by the way we pray, by the way we show example to one another. As we all know, the greatest, the greatest teacher in this life is example. We could say all the words we want, but if we're not giving example, those words are empty. The St. Paul reminds us over and over and over again. 
The robe that we wear, if, if you expand it 20 times, or in my case, 50 times, it looks like the vestment a priest would wear at Mass for that very reason. It is white to symbolize the solemnity and also the joy of the moment. And it has the, 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 the kiro, the symbol of, of the ancient symbol of, of our Lord, of our faith. Many churches have, have, other, uh, have other robes, whatever tradition works, but I love this tradition that we have in our collaborative. Drives me crazy every year when people say to me at the, uh, in December, Christmas Eve is the holiest night of the year. No, it's not. Christmas Eve is great. I'm the biggest fan of it, I promise you that. But the most important night of the year is the night before Easter, the Easter vigil, the great vigil of our faith. Every church in the world at the Easter Vigil has a fire burning outside of it. And that fire represents two things. The light of the world that the darkness cannot overcome and will never overcome. And also the promised power of the Holy Spirit. We take that fire, from that fire a light and we light an enormous candle. Each church, as I mentioned just a few weeks ago, just a week or two ago, received the new candles for the year. Every year we... Every Easter, we get a new candle, a new beginning. And we carry that candle into the church. We hold it up. We give thanks to God for the light. And then we use that as a symbol to guide us through not only the Easter season, but whenever we celebrate baptisms and funerals as well. You're all connected to that light. It's an ancient symbol, way before Christ. But we've taken that symbol given it a new purpose, a new strength, a new joy. And from that light, we each take that light and we hold it up and we proclaim, this is our faith, the faith that we have received, and we receive it and we pass it on. That's where the godparents come into play, how important they are in the life of, of, uh, of, of their children, their godchildren. It's my honor and my privilege this coming weekend to be sponsor for, for, my, for my niece and my godchild, Kelly. I'm so proud of her. Uh, of who, who, she is, who she is becoming and who she will be. It's connection from the moment that she was baptized to this moment, where she confirms her decision to receive Christ in her life and to live it to the best of her ability. The four symbols speak very clearly of our faith. We're called to live it every moment of our lives, not just every day or every year or once in a while, but every moment. For we are, at the beginning at the end, a child of God a member of the body of Christ. I want to mention a couple of things during this Lenten season. A couple of reminders. One is the rice bowls. I hope they're filling up. Many families have them either in their kitchen or in their living room or in a very obvious place in the house. Um, I hope they're filling up very, very good, very big. Or sometimes I hope they're quiet, uh, filled with, with bills, dollar bills, that is. I, 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 the, the donations, of course, go to Catholic Relief Services and their great work all over the country and all over the world for the poor. We also have a new initiative this year, these mason jars. Cor Unum is a, um, is a marvelous food pantry program coming out of Lawrence, Massachusetts, St. Patrick's Parish. And this is our, 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 our reach out to our brothers and our sisters around the corner. Father Paul O'Brien has been doing some great work at Corum. And if you're interested, you can look it up on YouTube, the great work being done at, at C-O-R-U-N-U-M, Corunum, which means one heart. And their food pantry, which serves meals 365 days a year, three hot meals to some of the poorest people in, 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 the, in the Boston area, in, in the country, who live in Lawrence, Massachusetts. This is our opportunity, and the reason we're using jars, jars without labels, is that we live in a society and a culture that tends to label people, especially the poor, to marginalize them. We don't want to do that. Only, uh, the only things that deserve labels are jars, not people. So we're using jars to collect. We still have them. If you'd like to pick them up, still plenty of time this Lent. Again, I urge you, we're, we're turning a corner now. Things are getting exciting. This weekend, yes, I have to wear pink. I'm not looking forward to it. But soon, we will gather in, in Jerusalem, and we will begin our, 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 our journey through these days of, uh, of Holy Week, where we will celebrate, we will mark these days at all three churches, 
as we prepare the way for our Lord, our Savior, and our King through his death, his passion, his death, and his glorious resurrection. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I will keep you in my prayers. Please keep me in yours. And uh, as we prepare our hearts and our souls for the spring that is inevitably going to come, we can rejoice in the eternal spring that our Lord has, bring out, has brought us in his salvation. God bless you, and go make disciples of all nations.